What does it mean for the Holy Spirit to empower us? Depending on what your background is, whether you have any background with the church or with Christianity, and, and if you do, what kind of denominational influence you had in there, when you think of the Holy Spirit, there's a variety of things you might think about. But when we usually think about the Holy Spirit empowering somebody, we usually, I think, will focus on the miracles that Peter, Paul, and others did throughout Scripture. Raising the dead, healing the sick, prophesying. Why is it that when we think of the Holy Spirit, why is it that we usually think of these rare and unique events in Scripture? Why do these come to mind? I think part of it's because we realize how broken our society and our world is. In the last couple of years, we've seen large-scale riots in Ferguson and Baltimore, and what it's shown is that there is a racial tension that's popped up in this country that we haven't seen for a long time. We have terrorism and economic trouble. We have a decreasing public morality, declining churches, a social war on Christianity. This nation is divided. I mean, this nation, one out of, out of many, one, this, that that's, does not hold true anymore. We are not one nation indivisible. We are one nation with, that is held together by a, a string at this moment. This nation aborts millions of babies every year. And many of the ones that aren't aborted are abused. Do you know that every year the U.S. has 2.5 million cases of child abuse that's reported? That's reported. Who knows how many the actual number is. The United Kingdom has, has said that in the last four years there's been a 60% increase in child abuse in the United Kingdom. We're broke. And so when we think of the Holy Spirit, a lot of us think and wish that we had the powers that God gave to people in the first century, don't we? When we sit there and we think about the Holy Spirit, we wish that we could do what the disciples did in the first century. When we see somebody destroying their lives with substances, we want to walk up to them, place our hand on them, look them in the eye and say, be free from this. When we have somebody that we care about that's dying from cancer, don't we wish we could lay our hands upon them and just say, be healed? Don't we? When we know people whose lives are falling apart and children being hurt and abused, we want to walk into the situation and by the power of God proclaim that something is different now and that it would be so. That's what we wish would happen. That's what we wish that we could do. But what we usually end up doing boils down to feeling helpless. And calling out to God and saying, change this world. How many times have we prayed, God, change this world? Change my neighbors. Change my spouse. Change this situation. God, change this world. God, don't you see all these innocent children being hurt and abused? Don't you see these children being killed before they can even draw a breath? Don't you see these people who neglect and, and don't take care of the people that they love? Don't you see these people who are just living in such horrendous situations? Don't you see this, God? Don't you see how your church is being attacked and slandered in every aspect in this society? Don't you see that, God? Don't you care that the people that love you are being hurt? Don't you see how families around the world are being torn apart and shattered by the bombs and the bullets of terrorists? Don't you see? God, change the president's heart. Change the Supreme Court. Change the terrorist heart. 
change the economy, change the laws, change the culture. God, why won't you just change something here? Am I the only one that's ever prayed that? God, I look at this world and it feels like we have absolutely no power. And I want your Holy Spirit to come and to do something that there can be something different in here. Because it seems like nothing is going to change and things are just getting worse. A lot of Christians know that God is completely capable of changing the world. We believe it. Even though sometimes... We don't see it. And even though sometimes we struggle to comprehend why God is not intervening in such a drastic and measurable way in these situations. But we believe somewhere inside of us that God can change the world. But when you look at Pentecost, that's not what God did. God did not change the world at Pentecost. You see, the disciples that gathered in that room, just like us, they were living in a broken reality. They had two major enemies at the time in the life of the, of the followers of Christ. You had the religious leaders of the Jewish faith that were persecuting the Christians because they felt like they were destroying Judaism. And, and the Pharisees and Sadducees and people like that led the attack against the Christians. These Jewish believers who knew that Christ was the fulfillment of the law. And on the other hand, you had Rome, this mighty empire that had taken over the entire Middle East, such as pretty much the entire known world at the time, and they were oppressing the Jewish people, and they were led by Caesar, and, and they were just... You had such a time of conflict right there. There were constant rebellions against Rome and constant strife between the Christians and the Jewish faith. And yet when you look at Pentecost, neither the Pharisees nor Caesar were changed by God. Why? Was God blind? Was God ignorant? Did God not realize that his followers were suffering? Did he not realize that his chosen people were being oppressed by Rome? Did God not realize? Is this why God did not change the Pharisees and change Caesar? No, that's not why. Here's a truth that we need to embrace and realize. When you look at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not come into the world to change the world or to change the Pharisees or to change Caesar. The Holy Spirit did not come into the world to change those. The Holy Spirit came into the world to empower the disciples to change the world. Oh, so many times we're like, God, why don't you change Caesar? God is not in the business of changing Caesar. He's in the business of changing his followers that the followers can, can change the world. And Caesar. Think about all the things that God did in Acts. The Holy Spirit did not sweep into the Pharisees and bring about a revival and suddenly 89% of them are Christians and missionaries. That's not what happened. What happened was that God filled His followers with His presence and His Spirit and they went into the lives of the Pharisees and they challenged them and preached the gospel and loved them and died for it. And God changed people. God did not change Caesar's heart. He did not show up in the throne room in Rome and say, I am the Lord, you will follow me. What he did was he changed a man named Saul, who we know as Paul, and gave Paul the courage to stand in front of Caesar and say, you think you are God, but you are not God. I know the God, and I will tell you who he is. And he died for it. The Holy Spirit did not sweep into Roman and Jewish towns and shatter the idols and bring about something different. But the, the Holy Spirit did was he empowered the disciples to go into those towns and to preach the gospel. And they were flogged and they were persecuted and some of them died. But they left a revival in their wake. And within 30 years, Christianity had soared throughout the empire. Illegal as it was. Why? Because God was just changing everybody who didn't know him, who didn't acknowledge him? No, because God was changing the disciples. 
And the disciples did what disciples do. They went out and they lived like Jesus. And they preached the message. And they showed the message. And God did something there. God does not move, oftentimes in scripture, you look, God does not move absent of his people. You Christians, you just stay over there and mind your own business, I'll take care of this. That's not the way it works. God did not go into Egypt and break the power of Pharaoh by standing there himself. Instead, he enabled Moses and Aaron to stand in front of Pharaoh and to work on his behalf. God does not move in spite of his people. He moves in his people and with his people and through his people. And lives are changed forever because God is using those who say, I am a follower of him. What does it mean for the disciples to be empowered? Yes, there's the flashy stuff you see sometimes in Scripture. And it's not even all the time. Sometimes in Scripture you see the raising of the dead and the healing of the sick. But the difference for the disciples when the Holy Spirit came into them was not the miracles that they could do. The difference was in who the disciples were. God empowered the disciples by giving them freedom from the power of sin. Not that he took away their ability to sin, but he broke the power that sin has on us that today I can choose in this moment I will do what is right by the power of God. And then he also set them free from fear. And instead of fear, they were filled with the presence and the certainty of God. It's not that they were never afraid of their own bodily pain that they were going to face but the pain the, the, the fear was lessened and the power and the love of God overwhelmed it so compelled by God's love you ever think about that sometimes we think of God's love and we're just like I just want to sit in God's love and enjoy this compelled by the love of God they face hostile crowds a hostile nation they face punishment and death because the love of God had filled them up to such a degree that they loved God more than they loved themselves. What does it mean to be empowered? That the selfishness and the sin and the fear that we are so intimate with, the power of that is broken and instead we are overwhelmed with the confidence and certainty of the Almighty God. They were empowered. Not for their own glory. None of the disciples started off with the idea that I'm going to be famous. If you're going to be famous, you don't preach something that's going to kill you. I mean, that's not the way people usually think about fame. Instead, they were preaching for the glory of God, proclaiming his message. And what is the message of God? What is the message of Christ? That we are broken sinners, but there is an almighty God who can take away the sin of the world. We should be getting some more amens on that. We are broken sinners in need of an almighty God who can take away the sin of the world. Can you believe Peter said that to the crowd? I love Peter. He makes me feel good about myself. Can you believe Peter said that? Can you believe Peter stood in front of a crowd and said what he did? How did he say it? Well, for one, 50 days, Pentecost, Penta means 50. So 50 days after Passover, Easter really should be celebrated at Passover because that's when it was. So uh, the, our calendar doesn't always work. But 50 days after Passover, the Holy Spirit comes down at Pentecost. 50 days before this event, Peter was denying that he even knew Jesus. He was running for his life. He was a coward. He chose his own self and comfort over Christ. And 50 days later, he's standing in front of crowds of thousands preaching the message of Jesus. That's what it means to be empowered. This coward that he was was changed to such a degree in such a short time that he stood in front of people hiding from fear of persecution before and now standing, making himself a target, saying this message of Jesus Christ. And what he said, no seminary would ever teach somebody to say. Peter doesn't sugarcoat it. Well, I'm sure you all are just nice and wonderful people. And, and, 
and you don't need to change anything. And everything's just, everything's just fine. We'll be having some cookies and balloons later for anybody that wants any of that. It, just, 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 just come to church. It's, it's going to be a good time. Peter stands in front of those who can identify him, of those who will then, some of which will persecute him, and says, you killed Jesus. That's not what seminaries teach you to say. Seminaries uh, sometimes teach you to, to make it as pleasant sounding as you possibly can, and yet Peter says, you killed. Jesus. If Peter was standing in front of us today, he would look at each one of us and say, you killed Jesus. Because it was because of Brandon Powell's sin that Jesus died on a cross. He actually looks at them. Some of them weren't even at the crucifixion and he proclaims, you killed Jesus. He did what so many are afraid to do these days and he called it like it was. You sinned. You killed Jesus. You worked against God Almighty in the name of God. You worked against God. But you know what? The same God you worked against loves you and cares about you and wants to forgive you of your sins and set you free. You see, conviction still works because we still need a Savior. And so many times we're afraid to say something is a sin. We don't say things are a sin because we want to make people feel bad or feel like we don't love them. We say it because without Jesus Christ, we are doomed by ourselves. And we need to be delivered. We need to be saved. It's like not telling somebody that they have cancer because you don't want to make them feel bad. Or if you knew that the Titanic was going to sink and you're like, well, it's really going to ruin their vacation if I tell them they're going to die. So have a good trip. Conviction of sin still works because we are still sinners in the need of a Savior. Amen. And you know what the result was of this convicting message of Peter? 3,000 people were saved. We are so afraid to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are so afraid to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we see all the works of Satan around us. And it's hard not to get discouraged, isn't it? You look at this world, and it's hard just to go, I just want to, I just want to throw my hands up. I just want to leave. It, you know, I'm going to, move to, I'm going to move to Belize. You know, I hear that's pretty nice. Maybe not in the summer, but, you know, it's pretty nice most of the time. I'm going to just move down there. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to hide out because I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't know what we can do. It feels like everything's falling apart. And I look at this nation changing. And honestly, when I look and I think about the society that my children are going to grow up in, where you can literally lose your job right now for saying certain things that the Scripture says, including several reporters at ESPN and Fox Sports who have lost their jobs because they did not approve of same-sex marriage. My children are going to grow up in a society where the society is going to pressure them. Instead of being Christians and everybody goes to church, you're going to pressure them that you don't become a Christian because you're going to lose everything. And I feel small. And I feel insignificant. I feel helpless and powerless about the nation that my children are going to grow up in if we even have a nation because we're broke. I can't do anything about this. That's the trap Satan lays for us. He makes us feel so small and powerless that you know what we do? We stay home and we pray for a deliverer. God, this place is a mess. Send somebody. God, this, this family's broken. Send somebody to my neighbors because they're going through a divorce. Man, my job is messed up. God, send somebody in here to fix this. Send somebody in here to fix Congress and fix the government. Send somebody in here, God. Send me a deliverer. We need somebody today. But instead of, del of a deliverer, I want you to consider these examples. I picked four. There's, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples. But there's four examples I wanted to give you of people who did not wait for a deliverer, but did something to change their world. There's a man named Andre Trockme. 
who was a French Protestant pastor in World War II. Now, when we usually think about changing the world, Andre did not win World War II. He did not kill Hitler. He did not stop the Holocaust. He didn't do a lot of the things that we would usually think of a deliverer doing. But you know what he did? He looked around at his society and he looked around his town and saw the evil that was going on. And with his own funds and his own effort, he saved 5,000 Jews. Now that might, might, that might not seem like a lot compared to 12 million people that Hitler killed. But I guarantee you that meant a lot to the 5,000 he saved. In the middle of a depression in Great Britain, a man named William Booth looked around and saw poverty and need. And he didn't pray to God and say, God, send somebody to fix this. He saw a need, and he did something about it. And he created a Christian mission that educated people and tried to help people, and he, and he uh, uh, created a soup kitchen as part of that. He saw the need, and he did something about it. Eventually, that Christian mission became known as the Salvation Army, and it's been changing lives for 120 years. He didn't start off one day saying, I'm going to create the Salvation Army that's going to be worldwide. He didn't even start off with the income that you would need to start off those. He looked and he saw a need, and he did something about it, and God changed the world around him. The wife of a preacher named Harriet was so moved in the 1800s by the plight of the American slaves that she did something. She didn't stop slavery. She didn't abolish it. She didn't start the Civil War by picking up a gun and starting shooting. She did the only thing she knew she could do, and she wrote a story. And that story became known as Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Abraham Lincoln said that book started the war. Because it stirred people out of their comfort zones and it buried it, the plight within them of what happens to people when they're treated like property. She didn't wake up one morning and go, you know, I figured out a way to start a civil war in which over a million people will die but will finally set the slaves free. That's not what she did. She saw a need and she did something about it, empowered by the Holy Spirit. There's a man named Martin de Porres who was a monk in 16th century Peru, and there was an epidemic going around. And instead of sitting there going, Lord, send a deliverer to heal these people. His brother monks actually voted to close the monastery so that they wouldn't get sick. And he, Martin, gave up his own bed to the sick and slept in the floor so that he could treat people with his own skill and his own money. He saved lives, but more importantly, the people saw the love of Christ and there was a revival. Did it change China? Did it change America? Did it change Russia? No, but it changed that town in Peru. When we think of deliverers, when we think of being empowered with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if I can't change every single person in the 7.2 billion people in this entire world. That's not what it is. There is evil around me. And God's calling me to do something about it. None of them started off as the head of an organization. None of them started off as somebody who was famous. None of them started off in, in, in charge of something that had the power to do what they wanted to do. Nobody started off with the authority of a government. Instead, they looked around. They saw something wrong in society around them. And they did something empowered by the Holy Spirit. And God used ordinary individuals to change the course of history. This morning, God is offering the Holy Spirit to anybody who is ready to be cleansed of sin, to be given a holy internal desire, which means you desire to do what is holy instead of what we want to do selfishly, and to live in boldness and godliness. But there's two things that have to change in our life for that to happen. The first thing is that we have to stop praying for a deliverer. We have to stop praying that God will send somebody to change this group of people. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. Do you realize that? 
the deliverer you've been praying for could be you. That's what scripture shows. Every single person God used was an ordinary individual. And he did mighty things through it. You can be the ordinary person that God uses to change a nation and to fix broken families and broken lives. You see, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are living out the mission of God, it is not Brandon Powell that is marching against the enemy of my soul. It is not Brandon Powell that is fighting Satan. It is not Brandon Powell that is trying to change society. It is God in me, God Almighty, the holy, perfect God who is working through me and in me, who is changing the world. I have never fought Satan, but God has fought Satan in me, through me, and with me because I got out of the way and said, here I am, God. God Almighty, not some weak little being. God Almighty dwelling in me, going to war against the enemy. The second thing is that we need to start praying for the Holy Spirit to change us. We pray so much, God changes the other person. We need to start praying, God, change me. When you look at the disciples, they were gathered together waiting for the Holy Spirit. The disciples were not gathered together waiting for God to change Caesar. They were not gathered together waiting for God to change the Pharisees. They were gathered together waiting for God to change the disciples. That's what Pentecost was about. They were gathered together waiting for God to change who they were. And then ordinary men and women, fishermen, uneducated people, former prostitutes, former corrupt officials, formerly violent people, went out into the world and proclaimed the truth of sin and the power of a Savior. And God did something. Sometimes we wish we could raise the dead and lay hands on and heal the sick, but you know what? Nobody ever got saved because the dead was raised. They got saved because they heard the message of Jesus Christ that there is a path to a Savior who will transform us and make us clean and new again. I don't need God to give me the ability to raise the dead. I need God to give me the power and courage to proclaim the gospel and to live it out and to do something in this world around me. You know, this morning might not be able to heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead and proclaim something to be different. But you can look around and say, this town has evil in it. This state has evil in it. This country has evil in it. This society has something evil in it. And I'm not going to sit here and ignore it any longer. And I'm not going to sit here and mind my own business any longer. And I'm not going to sit here waiting and praying for a deliverer. I'm not going to sit here any longer. I'm going to do something about it. And an individual, ordinary person can be used by God to kick down the gates of hell. And something can change in somebody's life. And that's what matters. The gospel says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell will not prevail means that the church has to march against the gates of hell and be at the gate in order to kick it down. I can't do anything about Washington, but I can do something about Sherman right now. And I can see a need and say, God, give me what I need to do something here. Right now. And maybe God will change the world. But God will change somebody's world. Are you ready to stop asking God for a deliverer? Can we just stop saying, God fix this country? Can we start saying, God fix me? How many of us would be like Peter, running from the threat? We need to be like Peter at Pentecost. We're afraid to be challenged. We're afraid to be criticized. We're afraid we won't be liked. We're afraid of the consequences. And God changes the world through the people that allow him to empower them to do the mission of God. Look around you. You know the things that are broken. Let's start asking that God would do something in us and use us to do something in the lives of other people. 
instead of waiting for deliverance.